Uh, so Dr. Alex again, it's, founder and CEO of Cosmo Software. It's so perfect the transition that I want to say that we haven't seen each other slide beforehand, right? But it's actually beauty, beautiful. I think Lorenzo explained very well that in the WebRTC world, uh, the quality depends on the capacity to adapt to the network condition quickly, and that is done on the client side. So for people coming from the voice over IP, it's obvious they've been doing it that way for a long time. But in the streaming industry or the broadcasting industry, for example, they do it differently. They do transcoding on the server side, and they do what they call ABR. Mm -hmm. So both the three mechanisms, simulcast and SVC and ABR, achieve the same thing, which is adapting the bandwidth of the stream the viewer will receive, depending on the available bandwidth and the screen size and so on. They just do it a different way. ABR is done on the server side and adds some latency. I will show some slide later. While SVC and simulcast is done on the client side, and so it's closer to the incentives of people in, in a real time, right? So the reason why there is some missing specific specification and standardization when it comes to um, SVC at W3C is because SVC is a codec feature. And the codec things are usually not standardized at the W3C. They're standardized at MPEG or ITU. And more recently, the real-time part is done at IETF. So the RTP, the media transport, is done there. So the people that speak SVC, usually everybody uses SVC here. You just don't know. The H.264 implementation of Skype is SVC. There is not a single, however old it is, implementation of a video conference that doesn't have an SVC flavor of the codec inside without you knowing it. So the Skype one is called 264UC for universal um, communication, and they have a white paper, but nonetheless, it's SVC. Um, so for everyone, the new codec, which is SVC by default because it brings a lot of advantage. Okay, it has a little higher uh, CPU footprint, but it comes at a lower bandwidth and a much better network resilience. So if you do codec only, this is a problem. But if you do real time and you have some network constraints, then this is also what you want. So there is an additional added value for people that do codec over the internet, right, in real time. It's done at the Alliance for Open Media, which is a separate standard. So everybody has, it's the same usual suspects. So Bernard, myself, uh, Harold, all the same guys are actually part of the three standard committee, but they each have a different mission, a different layer of the protocol stack. Okay, so I'm going to speak about the Alliance for Open Media, maybe the latest standardization group where there is less people, so the information is a little bit less visible, and I'm going to be specifically speaking about a subgroup that is dealing with the real-time aspect of everyone. Maybe. I don't know what's going on with my computer. We might just do it like that. All right. So OM is a membership-based uh, uh, alliance. It's based on quality and not quantity. It means you need to request to become a member. You're not automatically becoming a member and add it to a web page. You need to be uh, um, checked first. And there is a very, very, very strong legal point to the alliance. They want to avoid the problem they had with H.265, where they did a fantastic codec that was way better than anything else on the planet, and then they couldn't come together to actually have a licensing model that allow for people to adopt the codec. Um, and so the MPEG has a clear separation between the technical work and the legal work that led to that uh, possibility. Our media say from the beginning, we're going to tie the member not to sue each other and to play fair when it comes to all the IP-related rights. So whatever work we do is not going to be um, made useless by our inability to deal with the legal matter separately, right? The main target is the codec itself. So what does it mean? It means the bit stream, the format of the bit you're going to receive, and that should be able to be decoded by a compliance decoder. So there's two deliverables for like any codec, the bit stream specification and an implementation of the encoder, however uh, slow, to make sure that the bitstream your own encoder optimize whatever does will is compliant right so whatever you produce if it's readable by the decoder sorry i put encoder that's decoder decoder 
provided by the uh, our media, then you're good, you're compliant. That makes sure that any hardware implementation is also compliant and everybody can check. The secondary target for the subgroup we're going to speak is the AV1 RTP payload. In order, nowadays there is only one media transport left that really does a real time, waiting for quick to be ready, it's RTP. And RTP um, has the capacity to bring in different payload, a payload being a codec, audio, or video, or time text, the subtitle, and so on and so forth. So you need to explain for every new payload you bring how you're going to cut it into pieces and put it in an RTP packet. And then you get all the advantage of RTP, the real-time protocol, and, and then everything works well. So at AWAM, you have really two use cases that are represented. The people that represent the video on demand or pre-recorded content, almost live, close to live, by the way, all the way down to three seconds. Those are only interested in the codec. They are file-based, they are HTTP-based, the, the two biggest problem are the storage space and the delivery bandwidth. But the encoding time is not a problem. So they can be very, very slow at encoding, and they will be slow if it produce uh, a smaller file or a better quality for a smaller file because the cost will be this. The Netflix problem is very simple. Most of the people in the US have a four gigabyte data plan. How many hours of 1080p movie can they watch without those four gigabytes? And that's, that's a size optimization and not a latency optimization, right? You have a lot of people there. It's really fragmented. They all come at, as part of a chain, but they can feel different parts of the chain and just adjust input and input. Since there is no latency optimization, it's not a problem. So you have people representing cloud encoding, like beat moving. You have hardware encoder, ARM, Intel, not Qualcomm. You have a decoder only, so people that do the David project, for example, which is only a decoder for everyone. They don't care about the encoding, you know, not their problem but they need a fast decoder to put in a browser or to put in a device um, to be able to read the file they receive fast enough to uh, display them on, um, on screen. This group, for this group, the job is done. The bitstream and the decoder were delivered in March 2018. Since then, they've been working on hardware implementation, on some uh, afterthought. But as far as the compliance and the codec and the specification work is concerned, job is done. The testing part is not very difficult because there is no modification of the bitstream between the sender and the receiver. So you just need to check that what you encoder produce is readable by the uh, compliance decoder, and then the job is done. That explains why we see so many uh, library for everyone out there. I think there's 12 or 14 implementation that we know of, and almost half of them are decode only, uh, because that's really only the, 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 the part that is important in terms of performance and speed for most of the people in this use case. You know, you have people in the real time industry, right? Which means they need to achieve less than one second between the source and the viewer. And usually it's one way. For those people, the codec is important, but both the coding and the decoding, all the speed is important. The media transport is also important, and they need to be an SFU in the middle. And the reason why you need an SFU in the middle was explained and illustrated very well by uh, Lorenzo. If you want to take advantage of the SFU to have a better resilience to packet loss, to have adaptation of, to the bandwidth of the resolution and so on, without paying on the latency, you need or RTP with an SFU and an NSVC codec, right? So you have Cisco WebEx, you have Poly, and that's the new name. Video doesn't exist really anymore, but everybody knows what I, who I'm talking about. There is all cell, there is Facebook with Messenger and WhatsApp and so on and so forth. Here, it's very simple. Latency is king, and everything else becomes secondary. So you, you have a simple encoder in the sense that, um, for example, you cannot wait until the end of the conversation before uh, before sending frames, right? So that's what the people do in a video on demand. They do a two-pass compression. They do a first pass when they make statistics where they chunk depending on action scene and static scene and so on. And they use this statistic in the second pass doing the compression to achieve a better compression. Doing that allow them to have a per title uh, compression could give them better results than a preset for, for everyone. In 
uh, WebRTC or in real time, you, you cannot do that. You cannot, take, you cannot have a frame buffer that allow you to do inter-frame prediction. So you cannot have B-frame. So B-frame is a frame that linked to the next frame and the previous frame. If you do that, that means you need to wait for the next frame. That needs to wait for the acquisition time and you're already, you're already eating all your latency budget. So you have a simpler encoder because you do not support all the frame type. You do not, you do not have a, a, a frame buffer, so you cannot do intra-frame uh, um, optimization and prediction and things like that. But it needs to be super fast. So you're not going to achieve the same compression ratio, but that's fine because what is important is to get to the other side fast. The encoder, the media server, and the decoder must all be real time. You cannot optimize only the decoder, right? You, you need the entire chain, the end to end, to be, to be real time. So need, you need to define the media transport. We should help you in, uh, with achieving that real time thing. You need to define everything in the media server logic in mind, right? So it's not only codec. Usually when you design a codec, you want to achieve the best compression to, uh, to size ratio, right? Because you have all the time of the world and, and you find you used to have a Blu-ray disc, you know, <laughs> you're good. The codec is not enough for the real time people. And the deliverable now is the, the encoding, the decoding, the RTP payload, the header extension, and an SFU, right? What is not in the spec, but is needed f to have this in production, is to make sure that not only you support RTP, but you also support everything which use RTP as a base, or RTCP, the RTX, the retransmission, the redundancy, the forward error correction, the congestion control, the bandwidth estimation, and all this and all that, right? So testing is especially challenging, since now you need to have end-to-end -end testing with network instrumentation to make sure that all of the above mm -hmm. is working well before, before you ship it. And for those that have seen the Kite's demonstration before, you know where this is going. So this is more complicated than just the codec. You can only start really implementing it and testing it to the RTP payload once the bitstream is frozen. So that work really started only the practical work in March 2018. Beyond the simple RTP encapsulation, so just the chunking, I have a, I have a chunk of my big stream, which is AV1 a Lingo is called an OBU. And does it fit in an RTP packet, or do I need to fragment it and then unfragment it on reception? That's the basic. We're not even speaking about layer or anything. It's fitting my bit stream into my RTP layer. You need to go beyond that. You need the management of SVC, and you need to be able to have the logic in the SFU to use it to filter, meaning going from the high resolution to the low resolution. So, use this case for the real time. Again, there is another distinction within the real time, the people doing the video conference. This is two ways, everybody is mainly equal. You can have a lot of interesting optimization to scale. If you have voice activity detection and you can do uh, active speaker, then you can reduce the, the video part, for example, of, uh, of the rendering, of the receiving, to the five last active speaker. Right? And usually that means whatever the number of people attending the conference, you ever only push through all the way the five last active speaker, and so you scale very well, you know, power of five. Cascading is possible but not mandatory because usually when you have more than 20 people in a conference, you're already starting to speak over each other, so you're good. The Cisco dilemma, though the biggest problem in this use case is to be able to support legacy hardware or phone, but that's, that's another problem. In the case of the streaming, right, or the broadcasting, you're only one way. And you have the broadcaster and the viewer, which have two very different logic and environment. So you cannot, and not everybody is equal, you cannot have one app, this is Hangout and you're good. No, you're gonna have one different app for the broadcaster, one different app for the viewer, they will have different logic, they will speak to different uh, media server. You do not have all the scaling optimization that you have in video conference. Uh, active speaker, when you watch a movie or a live event, uh, you can yell at the screen and at the, the referee as much as you want, it's not going to change anything. So, cascading of server is almost always needed if you have more than 1,000 viewer, more or less. So it's, it's kind of really different in case of uh, a practical use case. In P2P mode, there is no difference between those use cases. 
It really doesn't make a change. If you only want have one server, it's almost the same. But when you start serving more than 1,000 viewers and need more than one media server, things start becoming interesting. So I already had the discussion about server-side server versus uh, sender-side bandwidth adaptation. Um, and this is the idea. When people stream in the, the streaming world, they use something fast first, like RTMP. You know, you're a YouTuber, you use OBS to stream your gaming session with you and your funny mustache and uh, you overlay uh, glasses and whatever hat you want. You're gonna encode, you're gonna capture and encode everything on your computer into Flash. You're going to use Flash to send it to the ingress node. The ingress node is going to decode, right? So media engine receiving. And then it's going to do transcoding and re-encoding in all the resolution you want, whether it's MPEG dash or HLS. It's the same principle, just the format is going to change between a fragmented MPEG4 or MPEG2 TS, CMAF nowadays if you're lucky. And then it goes to the to the viewer, which needs to decode it again. So if you if you account for the encoding decoding cycles, which are usually the most time intensive part of the of the path, you see two cycles. I have one cycle from the sender to the infrastructure. Then I have one cycle from the infrastructure to the, to the viewer. Now, if you do that sender side, if you do that uh, multiple encoding of different resolutions sender side, now you see that the simulcast is doing what was done by the transcoding in the, in the, in the infrastructure before, right? So if you count for the number of encoding decoding cycle, now you're down to one. You are a two cycle, now you don't do one cycle. So there's pros and cons. NBR was here way before WebRTC Simulcast. So there are some platforms that were created, let's say, five, seven years ago. They use ABR to complement uh, WebRTC without Simulcast. Fair. Um, if you were to do a platform today, that, that's not what I recommend to do. Now with Simulcast and SVC available in, in most of the browser, if you were to start today, that's the right choice. Um, you end up with uh, a low latency. Most of the people that do WebRTC plus ABR doesn't have a big impact on customers because when you go from three seconds to 500 milliseconds or from three seconds to 200 milliseconds, you, you're still happy in any case, right? I'm not going to spend time on it. You've seen it. Difference between Simulcast and SVC. Simulcast give you separately decodable stream. SVC give you incremental layers. That's also clear for everybody. Um, recent history of AV1, we focus on real time. So AV1 has been super fast. It's, it's a race, really. People have been r racing to try to do a word first uh, you know, PR. Um, I, I told you there is a legal protection from member to member. So every time there is a new member joining, that means they're not going to sue about the technology. So it's a good news for everybody. Right? And that's some people, I don't think, realize that when Apple joined in 2018, even though they have FaceTime and they're heavily invested in 265, that was really good news. It didn't matter if they were an active member or not, if they participated in the discussion. That means that was already a commitment not, not to sue on, on the things that were discussed. And that's really an advantage of the AO Media legal setup compared to MPEG, for example, where, okay, they're doing something, but you don't know if at the end when they're done and the codec is working, they will be able to get together to have a license pool or not. They did for 264, they couldn't for 265, and now they're hoping they will be able to do that for the next, but they haven't changed the legal setup of MPEG, so it's really wishful thinking. Um, we announced the first AV1 in RTP with WebRTC in 2018. It was definitely not real time. It was two frames per second, and it didn't support SVC. Uh, then Cisco announced uh, in June a demo of uh, AV1 real time in WebEx, so WebRTC as well, without SVC, but it was real time. So we got upset. We revisited our, our demo, and we, managed, we realized that LibAOM had a real time uh, mode in the meantime, so we almost didn't have anything to, to change and LibAOM performance improvement allow us to do, uh, to replicate the, the same thing, except that Cisco was doing it in WebEx, which is a video conferencing. We did it in Millicast, which is a streaming platform. Um, we still didn't have SVC, and SVC is difficult. So, now the real-time part, right? What about real-time? Well, there is the RTP. The easy part is the fragmentation. So you have 28 different modes in AV1 bit stream in the codec itself. 
You need to support those mods, recognize them, and then you need to decide if the OBU is too, is too big and should be fragmented in an RTP packet. And you need to do it in, in such a way that on the receiving, you can unpacket the bitstream and reconstruct it, right, to give it to the decoder in a format that is compliant. This is trivial. This is kind of easy. It's chunking. Done that for a long time. This is not a problem. The, the most difficult is to use the RTP feature to enable SVC and enjoy the network resilience, enable the NAC, enable the FEC, enable all those things. There is another um, catch. There are more modes in RTP AV1 than there is in AV1 bitstream. We add the KSVC mode where we mix simulcast and uh, SVC. So in AV1 bitstream, you only have the pure SVC, but now we have um, mixed. So that's what is in the codec document, where you have TU temporal units with temporal layer and special layer, and, and you get your packets that correspond, your OBUs, sorry, that correspond to each of the, of the layer. If um, they have an operating point bit mask, which is just a, a way to represent the, all the modes they have, so you, real, you see the letter T0 from um, right to left, T0 to T7, then S0 to S3, right? That represents you 12-bit masks. That's all the possible modes with 0 and 1. And then you go there. So you see it's only simulcast. You can see it's only simulcast because you always have a dependency between all the different layers. So the 0, 0 and the 1, 0 horizontally at the time 0 have an arrow between them. That tells you that the temporal layer have a dependency. So this is not simulcast. This is full SVC. If you had simulcast, you will be missing an arrow somewhere. Because, and then the stream could be independently decodable. So this is an example of a special two and temporal three. And this is where we're gonna have a problem. If you have an SFU in the middle, that means you know, at time number three, is sending, this, this is full resolution, but quarter time, one frame out of choose at what time you can actually change the, la the layer depend on that dependency chain. And people that do codec, they don't care about that because there is no filtering in the middle. You're not going to change layer. You choose it at the, at the beginning and then you receive it and you're good. But now we have an SFU in the middle that need to change that. So we need to help the SFU to know when to do that. So the reason why um, we had extra node compared to the AV1, compared to the codec, is when you use the bitstream on top of the, on, on OTT, right, on the web, if you use the naive implementation, you have a spike in CPU usage and in bandwidth usage. And this is not a problem for v people that do video on demand because you just send the stream uh, as you get them. But if it's real time and you need to send them as fast as you encode them, then you see the blue bar was the original AV1 codec specification. And so you had uh, a ratio or 4.5 to 1 in terms of bandwidth usage between the maximum and the minimum. So using, using shifted prediction structure and uh, mixing simulcast and, uh, and SVC allowed to smooth that and be a better network citizen and a better CPU citizen when you are streaming AV1. So you see, when it comes to real-time streaming or real-time communication of a codec, there is more than the codec. You need to take into account all of that. So that was a slide by Google that reported the problem and made the proposal. Now, the problem is that it can become a little bit complicated if you think about it. So if you see here the difference be, be, with the more traditional uh, AV1 only uh, structure is that you have a, a reference original point at the bottom left hand corner that is just here to have a root of the tree, right? But it doesn't contain any data or anything. It's just here to help. It's a, it's a fake, it's a fake packet if you want. 
to help having a common origin and define the dependency. And after one iteration, then you have a block that repeats itself, right? That is uh, surrounded in a dotted square there. And that's the L47 key shift mode. And that's not even the most complicated, but that's the only one that can fit in the A4 pages and be explainable, right? So believe me, you don't want to deal with that. And we go back to the web developer not having to deal with that and say, I would like to have some setting and make sure it works. And then I want to tell my SFU, um, I want a higher spatial resolution or I want a higher frame rate. And then the SFU deals with all of that, right? We need to help the SFU do that. One minute? Okay. So to help the SFU do that, we implemented a decode target information. This is something that is not at the codec level, not at the bitstream level, but in the RTP layer to help the SFU that receive that to decide which packet to keep and which packet to leave or when to change only by reading the RTP header, right? So we, we allow the SFU to skip reading the entire bitstream and so on to know which packet I'm speaking with. It is something I really need to do the current resolution that I've been asked by the viewer or not. Okay, don't worry about that. We have decoding target. So open source implementation. So what we did to implement it and do the demo, you start P2P. We started with LibWebRTC because it was giving us a capture, the codec, the RTP, the network. It was giving us everything. And we add, we took LibAOM for the implementation of the AV1 codec. It's not only a compliance library, but it's also a library that is used in production by YouTube, so it's also fast. And in April this year, they had a real-time mode. So now they can do 720p on my MacBook Air uh, at plus than 30 FPS. So I made a demo at ComCon UK. I made a demo at IETF in Montreal to a few people about real-time AV1 on a normal laptop using AppRTC modified, just that include our, our glue and our code. We have a Dark Arts WebRTC is the internal name. And uh, it's tricky, but we did it. So now the idea is uh, we didn't have, we have a simple RTP payload. Uh, we didn't have all the fragmentation of the headers and we didn't have SVC support. Uh, Google had that on the side for another project. So they implemented what we call the generic header description which is the part in the RTP header that helps you, that helps the SFU deal with SVC, whatever the SVC codec it is, so VP9 and AV1. So we're getting, if you want to test it, you can start with a P2P. You can test the basics, packetization and packetization, all of the modes that you have in a bitstream, but not the mode you have in an RTP because you're not doing filtering or changing layers in between the sender and the receiver. If you want to change the layer and test all those complications, you need to have a dedicated SFU. So we already had made a dedicated SFU for testing simulcast available for free to all the browser vendors and everybody as part of the W3C. Now we're planning with, uh, with um, Google to get together, man a, a, an open source implementation and provide the test and provide the compliance SFU. So the idea is if it's not tested, we don't know what we're missing in the spec. So if you want to mature the spec, we need to have a full implementation. Then if you want people to adopt something so complicated, they need to start from something that works. And so we need to provide the code open source. So we have not finalized the contract and everything, but this is very close to, to get out. We have an open source so a code that we would put out anyway. Um, so when is it going to be available? It will be directly in LibreBTC, directly in Chrome. Right now, our best guesstimate is uh, Q1. If to have all the tests, all the modes, the 28 modes in the bitstream plus the specific SFU modes and so on and so forth. Here you go. Thank you very much, Dr. Alex. Any uh, questions? Yeah, Chad. What is the use case for doing simulcast and FCC at the same time? Um, that's something they, they tested with VP8 and H.264. They do simulcast for the spatial and uh, SVC for the temporal. So that allows them to drop the, the frame just by reading the, the RTP packet. So the, the use case compared to SVC is that it's reduced the complexity of the dependency chain. Okay. And uh, I see is so Google, and you say like in a Q1 that's like inside Chrome, or is that 
At you, minima, you know, it will be in standalone LibreRTC. Okay, uh, it's like I, I suppose. Yeah, okay. I suppose it's going to be in Chrome yeah. as well. There is no so overhead for them yeah, to do I mean, that. I guess, well, my, my, my real question was, other than you and I guess Cisco did a demo, who uh, who is putting significant effort into? In real time, yeah, in, in the time. group, you have video, Polycom, you have Cisco, I don't know, there is nine or ten active members in the real time group. We believe some of them have an internal implementation, it's just not standard. Okay. And so that's also a way to make sure that people are going to be harmonized and interoperable instead right. of having. I really just want to know how special you are. <laughs> We're having a lot of fun. At least a little bit. So as far as I know, for real-time in WebRTC, Google doesn't have it. Stadia is based on VP9, so we're the only one. And that's why we're teaming up right now to, to make it happen. So two, Cisco and us.